Kyle Klingman with Track Wrestling. We have 2018 world champion and 2017 world bronze medalist. Also want to add in three WCWA championships for Simon Frazier, Justina Dostasio. How are you? Oh, good. How are you? Doing good. I, I mean, my understanding is you didn't really love wrestling until you got to SFU. Is that right? Yeah. Um, I loved soccer growing up. I never planned to like wrestle out of high school. I just did it because I had a really cool high school coach. Um, and then I didn't get a single scholarship offer for soccer. And my high school coach was like, you could wrestle. And I was like, okay, I guess so. I want to keep playing sports. And then I went to SFU and everything worked out. Mm -hmm. but what, what was it initially that you didn't quite like about wrestling? Mm, it was so hard. And, um, and I wasn't like, I'd watch other people wrestle and they were very technical and I'd watch myself wrestle and I was athletic and I was like, this isn't, this is fun to win, but I'm not like a good wrestler right now. I don't necessarily know what I'm doing. And I just like, um, I'd win stuff and it wasn't not to be like cocky or anything. It wasn't like hard the way like soccer, like I had to work so hard just to try and like keep up with my friends. Whereas wrestling sometimes it was so hard to do but then I'd win um, like tournaments, but I didn't know what I was doing. So I was just like, this is a weird sport. And then when I got to university, it wasn't until the end of my freshman year, I made the junior world team and I went to junior worlds. And I think it was the year um, Natalia Vrobieva won junior worlds. And I saw her wrestle and I was like, holy, that is so good. And I was like, okay, I wanna be that good someday. And that's when I kind of fell in love with when I saw how far I was technically from other people. So mm -hmm. those early foundational years, though, clearly you had some natural inclination toward it. Yeah, like I had success in it, um, but I didn't know what I was doing. So I, it was just more so I felt uncomfortable in this sport. And I like I'm a shy person. I'm not like the most crazy, um, aggressive person, which is weird that I ended up picking wrestling but I just wasn't comfortable in the sport the way I was with soccer it was a team sport and it was like all the girls I'd grown up with playing since I was probably like 10 years old and I was comfortable there so I liked it better yeah. everyone wants to make comparisons between football and wrestling are there any comparisons between soccer and wrestling um I have, I don't know I've never even asked that question um well, like working together with other people and like trusting your teammates um, in soccer was like the whole thing. And in wrestling, it being an individual sport, but needing like a good training partner and like coaches to teach me literally everything um, that I guess that like the trust necessary in both sports is, is pretty um, transfers over. Mm -hmm. Did you like the coaches right away at SFU? Uh, yeah, I did. Uh, when I when I got there, so my provincial teams and stuff growing up were uh, Justin's wife was my coach, Lindsay Abdu. And um, so I kind of knew Justin a little bit, but he was more coaching the guys team and I'd heard of Mike Jones, but it's like Mike Jones. So you're like, not scared to talk to him you're just intimidated by this person you've heard so many things about him and within like pro I don't even remember having an uncomfortable feeling with him when I got there it was like immediately like uh he makes you feel very welcomed very scared because you want to like perform because you hear he's made everyone great but very very welcomed Fill me in on Mike Jones, because I hear the legend of Mike Jones. Like, <laughs> who, who is he? Like, I've heard from Justin <laughs> who he is, but what, what's your interpretation um, of Mike Jones? To, I always joke that he's, like, the grandpa of our team. Um, you hear stories when he was, like, younger and how, like, strict he was and just, like, uh, a tough, tough coach. But I think he, like, knows how to coach everyone individually because, like, the friends I talk to, the teammates I talk to, we all have, like, a different view. And for me, he was always, like, encouraging and, like, trying to build confidence um, from, like, day one because I think he could see that's where I would grow the most. He never was, like – well, I mean, at times he was like, you need to get tougher, you need to get fitter, but more often than not, it was like, you need to think you can win. And that's what he's always pushed for me. Whereas like other people, he could see like they had that mental edge and he'd be like, improve your technique or improve your fitness. Um, and I think that's the thing that makes him so good. He's, he cares about you as like a person way more than he cares about you as a wrestler. And then that's what makes you a good wrestler. 
Justin Abdu is witty and funny and uh, quirky at times. Where do you side on that? He says some, half think he's funny, half don't. Where do you side on that? Uh, I really like him. Um, <laughs> I love his like quirky, funny stuff, his sense of humor. He like knows when to make a joke. Like sometimes I'll be just in like the toughest mood, the grumpiest mood, and he'll like crack a joke at, that I think is like the perfect time. And I'm laughing even though we're like dying at practice. And I think that's good, but that's my normal. I could see some people who would like to be focused and like not laugh when things get tough. I'm like, that could be, that could be maybe hard to adjust to, but he's, uh, he's traveled. I think he's traveled with me more, um, on my international stuff for an SFU coach than, than Mike has. So I've been able to do a lot of different things with each of them. Yeah. How about the dynamics at SFU where you, you get, Americans and Canadians and, and you have a really nice array of, of athletes there. How does that mesh for the program? Um, it's, I don't know anything different. So it's completely normal to me. Um, I think it's good because at times you can have two really good girls who, if they were from the same country, they'd be training for the same national team spot, but because they're from different countries, they can push each other without that, like, it, it does make the room competitive, but it doesn't put that fear in like, oh, I have to beat you every single day. Oh, you're beating me like kind of stuff because you both can have the same success for your own country. Um, and it makes it when you go to these big tournaments and you see people from the States or from Canada winning, um, it's fun to like cheer on like your teammates, regardless of what country they're from. I've always liked being able to say hi to the people I know because we went to college together and that kind of stuff. And you're close with a lot of the USA wrestling athletes. I saw you at one of the training camps this past summer. It seems like you interact with them quite a bit. Do you train with the Americans quite a bit? Um, well, just it was easy because when we started going to camps when we were younger, you're going and then I like cling to the people I know. And some of them were my American teammates who were from SFU and you just get to know everyone. And it's just been like years of going to camps together. Um, and then still now I'd say half our team is American and half Canadian so it's the same thing just who you're comfortable talking to and then unique situation here where you were at the Pan American Championships and then mm -hmm. Adeline Gray defaulted out did you guys have a conversation what was going to happen there oh yeah she was like um really polite about it came up uh before we went out there and was like hey like um I'm not going to wrestle just want to give you the heads up and then we just sat there and chatted like normal for a little while after and then they make you go out and raise your hand. And I was like, this is so awkward now. I'm, I'm shy. I don't, I like wrestling in front of people one-on-one, -on -one, but I don't like just walking out there and doing that part. <laughs> so you were always introverted growing up? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes and no. Like if you see me at sports, at wrestling, it doesn't look like it because I'm comfortable with that group. Um, and I can like coach stuff when it's about wrestling, but um, I'd say I'm, I'm, pretty shy outside of that like little world of mine mm -hmm. what do you like about coaching um I just really love the sport um I do love like I love the SFU team um I think it's easier to relate to what they're going through because I'm maybe like the freshman on the team this year I was nine years older than them so it's like a close age gap so I feel like it's very relatable and um I had such good coaches and thing, the things I've done in my career, I never imagined I would do someone else put that idea in my head. And then I was able to like train with their guidance and improve. And the idea of being able to like help someone else do that is really exciting for me. I want to, I want to coach eventually one day, like as a job. Um, but right now it doesn't even feel like work. It's like, it's just fun. I love being around all of them when I get to work with them. Tanya Verbeek is the face of Canadian wrestling. She's the mm -hmm. men's and women's coach for the national team. How does she do it? How, how do you see her balancing all that? She makes it look so easy, but I bet it's probably not. Like, she shows up all the time with a smile on her face. Um, anytime I have questions, whether it's, like, at a tournament or, like, right now, like, I have a phone call planned with her for later uh, this week. Um, she's always available, and I – I love my coaches. Most of them have been male. They've all been super helpful for me. But there's like a difference when you have Tanya Verbeek, who's done everything I could dream of doing in a sport, telling you like, you can do this because she has been there and she has done it. And for her to say that to you, I like, 
I like fully believe when she tells me I can do things because she did it. She wouldn't say it without like not knowing what it takes. So that part, um, I think it's like irreplaceable having a female coach who's done it all do that for you. It's really helpful. And then you did it in 2018. You won the world <laughs> championships that had to feel good to reach that mountaintop. Yeah, it was, it was a pretty cool day. Mm -hmm. what, what goes into the decision? Cause that was at 72 kilos. And then for the Olympic cycle, did you just decide, Hey, I'm bumping up trying to go to the Olympic weight and forego 72 for the, the remainder? Um, yeah, I, so I went to 72 because we have the way in Canada, it's you have your Olympic trials and your non-Olympic trials. So I always try out for 76 um, because I want to wrestle the Olympic weight class. And then Erica won. So the, a month later, I tried out at 72. And that was just the plan for um, that year. Uh, then I went back up to 76. But I have uh, this little neck thing. So right after... Uh, worlds I had to take time off again and just like settle that down and rehab it um and then we just had to make the choice what we were going to do and because I'd gotten like going to 72 you do have to lose like muscle a little bit and like uh obviously like body fat and it's harder to get back up to 76 since then and then getting hurt I couldn't put the body weight back on as quickly as possible which was frustrating um so just like to give myself uh the best chance to be big I had to stay and like not do anything at that weight class for, for that year. Did this postponement going to 2021 affect what you're going to do the next three to four years? Um, not really because I'm, I'm the Olympic alternate for 76. Um, so that kind of put all my tournaments and whatnot on hold for a while. Um, so I think it's the same thing anyway. You're just, I'm the alternate, um, staying fit, staying ready. And then whenever, a schedule finally comes out, I think that's when we're going to make the decisions of what's going on. Um, but we hadn't even gotten to the point of really planning beyond just like stay fit as the alternate. So it didn't change anything for me. But would you like to go maybe another three to four years? I know you're being. Uh, like yeah, I want to. That's the plan. Um, Cause I, yeah. So moving out, finishing school and then um, going back and fully focusing on wrestling for the next, um, yeah, I guess it's still four years. Yeah. How has Simon Fraser been doing this? They, they've really built a, a great powerhouse with the women's side, especially. How do you think they've built it to that point that it's a, a national power? Mm, well, I will always be biased about it. I think it's the best program you could have. Um, I have no intention of leaving it. Like, I fully believe it's training. It'll help you reach whatever goal you have. And I think that's kind of um, – one of the key successes of the room it's they really value what everyone brings into the practice room and whether um the coaches have preached this forever so I'm just like saying what they say but like whether your goal is to have like a winning season all-american uh WCWA champ national team member world team member like world champ um they're going to do everything they can to help you achieve those goals but the training is um well, I think it's like world-class practices in general because your training um, from when I was in college to now, it's still like the same schedule. They have you on like a um, national team schedule almost. Like you have your Sundays off and stuff and like you have to follow the rules of the college wrestling, but they made it in a way where you don't really have to change from like, okay, I want to be a good college wrestler to I want to be a good international wrestler. They kind of have that... Um, approach to the sport um of like the balance of technique and weights and running and all that stuff um and I think that's what helps the girls succeed like young and then build into successful international careers when that transition happens just because from day one you get to see all these older people doing it and you see yourself doing it so that belief of like I see these people succeeding if I do this I'll succeed it's like there from day one yeah. do you like the direction right now of women's college wrestling yeah, um, I think it's, I think it's really good how much opportunity there is for girls to continue to wrestle um, in college. Um, I still think it's super competitive, the college leagues. Uh, this year, how they split, split it out. I wasn't as involved in the team this year because we had our Olympic trials and whatnot. But when I came back in, there were those two national tournaments and you're having good wrestling in all these 
tournaments it's amazing to see because I just think back to when I was in college like you had 13 schools my freshman year now there's two leagues of way more than 13 schools and that's kind of crazy what kind of feedback do you get from young girls that identify you as a, a hero and, and look up to you <laughs> um <laughs> there's like local kids and like bc kids and they're just always so sweet and like when they say that stuff i'm just baffled that someone could look up to me like that because i'm like no we gotta look up to these other people like i don't know the carol Huynes and the tanya rubiques and like danielle lapage those are the people i think of all the time so it's really like uh heartwarming when people say that stuff to me so those were your heroes growing up yeah like you, well i mean once i got to college like danielle and Stacy Anaka, they were like on my team and a bit older and um, they taught me how to wrestle uh, even when I didn't know how to wrestle. Um, and they're like two of my best friends still. So they're definitely two of my like hugest wrestling heroes. And then I think every girl in Canada grows up looking up to Carolyn and Tanya Verbeek. Yeah. I've heard you're a monster in the room. Like Julia Salata said she <laughs> can barely even get to your legs or take you down like you, you must have a, a good presence in the room then. Uh, I, I try really hard. Um, I love wrestling. I like, I like practice. Like practice is really, really fun. Competition is really, really fun. Um, when it stops being fun, I'll figure out something else to do. But I'm just like, I play the sport because I, I have fun doing it. So, yeah. Where'd you get the nickname Juice? <laughs> um, my dad has called me, my whole family, um, have called me that since I was a little kid. He just said I had a lot of energy, that I had a lot of juice in me. And then it stuck forever. Do most people call you that or is that kind of? Uh, in wrestling, yeah. Okay. And like, even when I grew up in school, my like high school teachers and everyone called me that. Mm -hmm. I've read your, proud of your, your heritage and your background. Mm -hmm. Explain that. Tell us what your background is. Okay, so I am, um, my last name is Estasio, I'm half Italian, uh, and my mom's Cree. It's uh, Norway House Cree Nation um, in northern Manitoba, um, and it's just cool to be, I, I waited a little while, like probably the past two years, till I started like speaking up about being Indigenous and just working with some different teams and like going to different communities and like sharing my story in sport. Um, it's exciting and uh, a bit of confidence to be like someone to be like, hey, like I've done what I've done and I am what I am. And just to like say that, cause I don't know, I feel a pressure about having to um, speak out about it, but like a good pressure, like a proud kind of pressure for it. Mm -hmm. Explain that pressure. I don't, I don't know if I quite understand. So I don't, um, I am Cree, but I never want to like be like representing of a whole group of people. So when I like speak about it, I'm like, here's my story and it's very individual for me. And if like you can take something positive from it, but I can't speak on everyone's like behalf saying like I'm indigenous and um, all this stuff. I just want to make sure I say like the right things when I do speak about it. And if like sharing my story and sports and just like the belief that like I came from where I came from and I've done what I've done if someone could take a piece of that and um I don't know find some confidence or inspiration from it like then I feel like I'm doing a good job about it but I never want to um generalize like the overall experience of indigenous people when I speak on it mm -hmm. do you think it was magnified when in a world championship that they now have expectations that you can tell your story um I think it I felt the responsibility to kind of like improve on my public speaking skills, um, which are constantly something I'm trying to improve on, uh, to share my story and like make sure I say things how I want them to be uh, heard. And I've learned that because I've done certain like interviews um, in like paper and print, and it comes out completely different than what I've said. So just when I do speak on, uh, a topic that I feel is like more sensitive and needs to be like spoken on properly. Um, that's what I mean by like that pressure of saying the right things when talking about being indigenous. Mm -hmm. You got a good crew there. You what Mallory Velty, Dom Parrish, you can go on down the line. It seems like yeah. you guys are really tight. Yeah, no, it's a really good team. It's a really good training room. Um, I'm like the oldest girl there. So for a little while I was like, Oh, this is weird. But then they like come in and, have the exact same goals and work 
ethics and everything and it's because it used to be I was the young one and I'd follow Dan and Stacy and I'd just be like okay let's just do what they're doing and then when I was the oldest one I was like who's gonna sh like do all this with me and it's they just keep bringing in all these good kids and they keep wanting to wrestle and it's awesome yeah what's, what's next for you I know we're in, in a little bit of a quarantine but uh, mm -hmm. how's the training going right now um so my dad let me take over the garage in the back and my trainers gave me some weights um and I had a I thought it was like a real air down bike but when I showed it to my uh, trainers they were like okay like that'll do and we just set up a little gym back there um and it's like the same schedule like I work out like six days a week and uh one day off but it's just like an hour and a half a day um trying to like stay focused on the fact that we need to stay fit for when like we get back into wrestling but also um like the mental side of it like don't freak out that things are not nowhere near normal like control what you can control and I think uh having like that one workout a day is very helpful for that have you found that the United States and Canada view women's wrestling different um I see that in the United States like girls still have to fight for like the right to wrestle in certain states and you keep seeing it getting like sanctioned and whatnot which is amazing I never experienced that in Canada in Canada it was just like you want to wrestle okay like there's programs at middle schools and they just throw the girls and the boys together and at practice and everything and I I never thought it was something um like I took it for granted I thought that was normal and then I got to college and I hear about my teammates who like had to wrestle boys state and I was like if I had had to do that I probably wouldn't have wrestled like they're so much tougher than I would have been at that age um so I I'm very happy that it's growing so much so that little girls can have the experience I had where they never had to think twice about being welcomed in like a wrestling room mm -hmm. if you're not wrestling what are the things you like to do outside the sport um <laughs> I always struggle with this when I'm like when I'm not wrestling like wrestling so hard I just come home and I'm so lazy I watch a ton of Netflix I read like the littlest bit um I've been like when I'm in school it's nice to have something else to do but uh I'm very social so like normally I'm just like hanging out with my friends and whatnot um yeah but I don't have like a big like a uh, hobby or anything so if you're watching movies, do you like to just keep trying to watch different ones or do you have your mainstays you go back to? I have my, um, like my shows I go back to. Like right now during quarantine, I'm rewatching Grey's Anatomy and that's like 15 seasons. So it's taking up a lot of time. <laughs> or I rewatched Friends probably like 10 times. Mm -hmm. And then what was there, Love and Basketball? I think you liked that one. Uh, the best movie ever. Have you seen it? I have, yeah. It's, it's so good. <laughs> yeah, it was a couple of years ago. I finally watched it. So I have, so I have it on a DVD. And when we go on our like first big trip of the year for SFU, Justin will let us bring DVDs along. And I think it's gotten booed like every time I've tried to play it by like half the bus. And like by the end of it, they're like, "Okay, that was a pretty good movie." I'm like, "Thank you." Well, and with this, how do you uh, how do you punk? Justin Abdu, what's your way to get to him and, and rattle him a little bit? Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't say I ever rattle him. Um, so if he's not texting me back and I have a question sometimes, I'm, I'm friends with his wife, so I'll be like, can you get Justin to check his phone? And I'll get a reply pretty quick. I've only had to do that a few times, but um, yeah, he's definitely much more of the jokester person and I like to laugh at it versus me doing anything back to him. 